Welcome back to the Dry Fasting Club and the beautiful world of dry fasting. I'm Yannick Wolf, and today we're going to be talking about the science behind how dry fasting reboots your autophagy and fixes your cellular health. So this is part three of this mini series of the science behind dry fasting. It's going to focus on a paper called Hypertonic Stress Promotes Autophagy and Microtubule Dependent Autophagosomal Clusters. Yes, it's a mouthful. But this is a really great paper that mainly looked into autophagy pathways along with a state of a hypertonic state, which basically means a higher salt state in the body. What does that have to do with dry fasting? Well, the longer you dry fast, the more water we lose. Our aldosterone and antidiuretic hormones go up, which slowly, continuously create a more and more hypertonic situation in the body. Other than autophagy, why do I really care about this? Well, when it comes to a lot of illnesses, autoimmune illnesses, we have problems or rather we see problems with autophagic pathways. So for some reason, the whole mechanism there slows down or even gets shut off. And if you think about it, Slowing down and affecting the body's recycling systems is for sure going to cause an accumulation of debris, and this could be various forms of debris, cellular debris, that will, over time, deteriorate your condition and your health. And I do believe that autophagic dysregulation is one of the driving factors in aging and disease. So before we continue, I just want you to be aware of two terms that are used throughout this paper and I'll be using throughout the discussion. There's hypertonic and there's hypovolemic. Hypertonic is a high salt stress, if we're talking about hypertonic stress. And if we're talking about hypovolemic stress, that's where you actually lose water. So it's pretty good to make this quick correlation before we dive deeper that A dry fast starts off with hypovolemic stress as the hours continue, and then it slowly transitions or adds on hypertonic stress. And afterwards, you might be wondering, and it's logical to ask questions like, is this actually safe? So is hypertonic or hypovolemic stress safe while dry fasting? And according to the one research paper that we have that tracked 10 participants, during a five-day dry fast shows us that, yes, even though it seems like there should be dangers and risks, it actually seems to be safe if adhered to properly on a five-day basis. And that paper is called Dry Fasting Physiology Responses to Hypovolemia and Hypertonicity. I highly recommend you take a look at it. This is a direct quote from that paper, and I think it's really important. I know it's a little off topic, but I think we'll add it in. Due to the uninterrupted excretory and metabolic activity of the organism, dry fasting involves three risks, blood hypertonicity, hypovolemia, and hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia is obviously low blood sugar. The first risk is a particular consequence of insensible water loss, the second of urine discharge and electrolyte loss, and insensible water loss, and the third of fueling of the metabolism. And here is the conclusion after the three risks are stated by the paper. Yet, the participants in the aforementioned study demonstrated normal blood pressure, normal heart rate, and normal hemoglobin oxygen saturation. Safe values of serum creatinine, urea, potassium, sodium, and glucose, and a moderate increase in serum osmolality, and a substantial increase in glomerular filtration rate. These observations show the effective compensation of all three risks and indicate subtle background mechanisms orchestrating the responses of all involved systems and organs. So what does this tell us in the end? They are trying to basically say, yes, it's safe. But please remember, The participants in this study have had been dry fasting for a longer period of time, and they did it for religious purposes on a yearly or multiple times a year basis. And this just goes to show that if you're trying to be really safe, you do need to see gradually working your dry mass, your dry fasting muscle up is sort of a prerequisite to dry fasting. I mean, I know you'll hear stories of people jumping into longer ones, but they're sort of throwing Hail Marys and just 
taking unnecessary risks. So this paper talks about microtubules and autophagy. And what are microtubules? Basically, think of them like highways inside your cells. They're essential for keeping the cell in good shape and making sure everything inside gets to where it needs to go. In the article on the Dry Fasting Club website, I have some beautiful images. I'll try to throw them in here. The microtubules are crazy when you look at a cell, and a cell has a lot of them. They're necessary for a lot of things, like making sure the cells divide correctly, keeping the cells shape, and like I said earlier, they're the cell's highway system for moving nutrients, lysosomes, and other things throughout the cell. Now, you might notice that fixing these microtubules should probably be very important. You can kind of think of them as the skeleton of the cell. A healthy skeleton is necessary, but throughout while we age and the debris accumulates and damage accumulates in the cells, and then they divide with this damage and potentially continue it with subsequent mitosis and replication, you start to realize that if there was a way to fix this, that'd probably be a really good thing. By fixing the cell's internal highways, we basically make it more efficient. We improve everything. And a more efficient cell is going to lead you towards health as opposed to deteriorating your health. And to do that, it also needs very powerful autophagy mechanisms. Our body can't function without autophagy. At least it can't function correctly. Okay, let's start looking at this study. Hypertonic stress promotes autophagy and microtubule reorganization. And it's important to remember that they used kidney cells in this study. And our kidney cells are more intense versions of our regular cells, especially when it comes to their ability to adapt to hypertonic stress. So in this study, they were probably able to provide them with higher levels of sodium and more acute hypertonic stress without the cells dying, whereas this wouldn't have happened with regular cells. And it's pretty obvious that acute hypertonic stress, if for some reason we were to give our body this shock, like a very strong hypertonic stress, our cells would ex be expected to die. But if you do it gradually, we see that there are mechanisms that the cell activates to preserve itself. A lot of it has to do with osmolites, and I talk about those a lot. And it is something that you should look into, especially the osmolite protocol, because these are one of the keys to surviving hypertonic stress. And I don't mean just surviving because we'll most likely survive gradual hypertonic stress, but I mean thriving and coming out of it feeling better than ever. I do highly recommend you look into the articles about osmolites and dehydration and you'll understand how necessary they are for keeping the proteins folded correctly and letting the cell continue healthy function and cleansing itself properly while under the stress. So one of the most important things, and I have a beautiful graph here, I mean it's a little fuzzy, but I tried to pull it out of the paper, that shows LC3 phase 2 expression, and it shows, shows it under three conditions, starve, NACL, and a combination of NACL and STARVE. So STARVE is nutrient deprivation, NACL is the actual hypertonic stress with higher amounts of sodium. In a, the first part of the, the science behind dry fasting series, I talked about how a one-day dry fast is equivalent to a three-day water fast in raw autophagic power. And in that discussion, I specifically talked about LC3 proteins and how we use them in science now as a biomarker showing us how much autophagy is happening at a given time. When we see more LC3 phase 2, it means autophagy is occurring. So in this paper with these LC3-2s, they looked at nutrient deprivation and hypertonic stress, and we see how much LC3-2 expression is being shown. And we can see that all three of these situations increase autophagy quite drastically. However, the hypertonic situation increases autophagy almost twice as fast. And then if you mix nutrient deprivation and starvation, you get the autophagy even faster. However, there does seem to be a threshold that needs to be taken into consideration. It looks like there's an autophagic threshold, and it doesn't matter if you do 
nutrient deprivation or hypertonic stress, you will eventually hit it. So really what's happening here is we're seeing that with dehydration, we can get there faster. And that's where there's this light bulb moment and you start to make the correlation with the Russian dry fasting clinics that advocate for doing something like a three-day dry fast and then transitioning into a water fast as sort of a hack where you still avoid the potential risks associated with dehydration, but yet you still speed up autophagy. So it's kind of like mixing the best of both worlds. However, we do need to take into consideration the microtubule reorganization and the different type of autophagy that can happen with dehydration. And that's when we realize that there's a lot of variables in this calculation. And depending on your situation, you might want to alter your protocols and your decisions during the healing journey. So what do you need to know to make that decision if you want to go into those extended dry fasts, if you want to mix them, if you want to keep to short ones, or if you just want to water fast? A lot of it comes down to this concept of microtubule reorganization along with more efficient autophagy. I have another few beautiful pictures from this research paper that looked at the cell's microtubules and we see uh, two images here. We see it has the control group and two different stages during the hypertonic stress. And then we see it uh, in the green as well, but the green images focus on the lysosome concentrations inside of the cells. So in this first image here, we see what a normal cell's microtubules look like and they're still spread throughout the cell. And then we see that two minutes into the hypertonic stress, there's not a lot of change. But we do see that it seems that even after just two minutes, there's some sort of effect happening. And in the images, we see that the microtubules actually disperse a little bit. So you can see the nucleus more clearly, whereas before they were kind of all over the place. As the hypertonic stress continues, we see how the microtubules start reorganizing. And you can see this really organized cluster coming into the center of the nucleus. That's the reorganization that we're seeing. And then the other part of this whole equation we can see in the green images where they track the lysosomes. We can see that over time with the NACL, so the hypertonic situation and the red dots, you can see that they start concentrating in the center. So you're getting a higher concentration of lysosomes going to the cell's nucleus, which is arguably one of the most important parts of the cell and concentrating there, creating good recycling and upregulating autophagy. If you want to see it in more details and better explained, more scientific explanations, then I recommend you look at the article and read it. But what does all of this mean? So in real time, our cells are restructuring their skeletons into a more efficient version that focuses all its strength on healing and maintaining the cell's nucleus. Proteins may be misfolding and the cell knows it needs to be ready to take apart anything funky as soon as possible. Imagine an all-hands-on-deck type of situation. This creates the most efficient highways in the cells and starts calling in the troops, which are the lysosomes, in high amounts. Anything that is off gets the recycling treatment. And what's important about this? Well, if you are suffering from a severe illness that nothing seems to be helping, this is your body's way to help. Potentially, you're suffering from autophagy dysregulation, and this is where that sloppy, degraded autophagy gets a kick in the butt and a push in the right direction. This is the reboot that sick and old cells need and get with proper dry fasting. Another really important thing in this study was that they actually looked uh, at the different conditions that induce autophagy to see if the hypertonic situation actually adds to autophagy or if it's not just some byproduct mechanism that triggers something else. And you know, what they did was they mixed hypertonic stress with compounds. And we have one here, which is rapamycin, which we know is an autophagy inducer. And it's because it turns off the mTOR pathways in the body. And I'm sure you've, a lot of people have heard about it as something that people take for longevity, uh, kind of like a biohack 
to mimic fasting environment, mimic a fasting environment in the body without actually having to fast. What was pretty crazy when they tested rapamycin and hypertonic stress, one hypertonic stress had a little bit more autophagy, but when you mix them together, it didn't really have an additive effect which means that there is an upper threshold and there's some limiting factor in the body when it comes to this. So what the study needed to see was, was it rapamycin slash nutrient deprivation that was triggering this autophagy or could or was hypertonic stress by itself a powerful autophagy inducer? And to answer that question, they needed to test a few more compounds with it. And that's where lysosomotropic factors, or that's where lysosomotropic agents come into play. What are those things? Lysosomotropic agents are any agent that can affect autophagy and lysosomes specifically. So they usually affect the pH values of the lysosomes. And we know that the higher, uh, the more acidic the pH, the better the lysosome functions, the more it activates. And the lower the pH, the more you push into, not the lower the pH, the more alkaline the more alkaline the pH, the less the lysosome activates. So it's almost like you're trying to put it to sleep. And when they mixed these, they checked a few different compounds and they and they were able to see that even with compounds that slow down lysosomes and make them more alkaline, alkaline like chloroquine or hydroxychloroquine, which is bad for autophagy and you should never mix it when you're trying to heal through autophagy and fasting. It showed us that hypertonic stress is very powerful on its own, even when paired with these agents that are trying to slow down autophagy. And when it was paired with agents that improve autophagy, autophagy actually surpassed that threshold, that, that LC3 second phase expression threshold. That's really cool. What's interesting when we take this whole study into consideration is does autophagy require nutrient deprivation it seems that not really does that mean that we could dehydrate our bodies but keep eating potentially but these are kind of crazy ideas and i wouldn't experiment too much with that for now but what does this mean for healing and hypertonic conditions basically we are able to start seeing the connection between dehydration and deep healing that many people look for these microtubule and autophagosomal clusters come into play when there is a hypertonic environment. This means you really need to get into dehydration. You might think that a few days of dry fasting will get you there because you start to get really thirsty and hungry, but the answer is that you need to at least get to the stage where your mouth starts to get very dry. A good indicator that you are reaching a milestone is when that dry mouth occurs. Early in this stage, you may fluctuate between normal and dry mouth depending on how much you're moving or resting. And it also depends on how much your mouth is open. So if you are pushing into those heroic length dry fasts, I have a few strategies. One of the main ones are to tape your mouth during the day and while you sleep. You may already be doing that because you've read some research on the benefits of nasal breathing over mouth breathing. But basically, embrace the dehydration. But if you plan on continuing much longer with the dry fast, then do it carefully, read as much as you can, and stay safe. Good luck on your dry fasting journey. Thanks for sticking around. If you liked the video, leave a comment and share your ideas. And if you're looking for very detailed and unique protocols, check out the dryfastingclub.com. You'll find a lot there. You can even book a quick chat with me. There's also a free Discord link that you can find on the site. And I highly recommend you check out the forums and share your insights and experiences about dry fasting. Uh, you can kind of treat it like accountability, but really you can help a lot of other people. And as always, remember, no two people are the same. So every fasting experience is unique. Good luck on your dry fasting journey.